Hi everybody and welcome to Field Sports Channel's podcast. This is episode three and I'm your host Aaron Jones. This episode is a bit of a chilled laid back episode with a good conversation all about deer stalking and some near death experience, which we'll come back to in just a moment. I'd like to jump in and just ask if there's anybody out there in the community that would like to promote some things that are happening within those communities, then please get in touch with me. I'm going to be starting a bit of a notice board at the front of these podcasts where it gives you an opportunity to promote anything that's going on around your local area, whether it be a open clay shoot, a dog show, some information that you just want to get out and get in front of people, then please use us to do that. If you want to send me any information, then send it to Aaron, double A-R-O-N, at fieldsportschannel.tv, and I'd love to hear from you. So the show this week, uh, David went up to West Scotland and met up with Nar Roundtree. Uh, they spent some time together a little while ago out in New Zealand, which I'm sure that you can find on our YouTube channel if you'd like to see those. Would depend on when you're viewing this. They could even be out right now or they might be out sometime very soon. I'm not entirely sure. I should have checked that before starting. But anyway, you can check that out on YouTube, which is fieldsportschannel.tv, and uh, you can enjoy those. Uh, but this time they're up in Scotland and uh, they have parked up on uh, the lock side of Loch Sunar. I'm sorry if I've got that pronunciation wrong. Please feel free to correct me. Um, and uh, they have a good chat all about uh, Nile. And this is what these podcasts are kind of about, is to kind of go behind the curtain a little bit and get to know the people that are our stars and our guests on the show as well. So this is actually quite a good good conversation. I mean, they cover all sorts of things like uh, bow hunting, uh, deer uh, farming in New Zealand, uh, rewilding, uh, and all sorts of things. But the very first story that Niall comes out with uh, is quite an extraordinary tale. So, um, and quite an introduction into deer in general, really. But anyway, enough of me waffling on. You'll hear some uh, little bits at the end of this show from me just to close out. But until then, enjoy the conversation. Okay, guys, roll the thing. There's nobody else here. It's just me in the studio. I'll roll it. We've known each other for 18 months, two yes. years now? Yeah, coming on two oh, years yeah, yeah, at least, yeah. yeah. Okay, <laughs> for you. Um, when we first met, you talked about your sort of introduction to, to deer, which was pretty traumatic, and what happened with your father. Can you explain that to people if they haven't heard that story? Well, uh, the I would say the earliest sort of frightening encounter I had with deer was uh, when I was a kid, about uh, 11 years old. And uh, we came back from uh, having been at church on a Sunday morning. And my father had uh, park stags at that time that uh, the Moncrief family had had at Kinloch for many, many years. And probably just to make life a bit easier in those dark and wet winter's days and to save the trudge all the way up the hill to the deer park, he'd got into the habit of leaving the gate open. And uh, the stags would come and shelter around the house and in the barns around about the house and were in the habit of being fed on the doorstep. And it's a great sight. I mean, to see huge stags on the doorstep was something. I mean, I've been fortunate. I've been surrounded by deer all my life. But there are some lessons in it too, you know, because uh, <laughs> when, when they become tame, they, lo they lose their fear of man. And on that particular day, he went out to feed them. He was in his tweed suit, but he was in his dress tweed suit. So there was no knife in his belt and none of these things. And he went out and uh, put feed out for the stags. And at that time, I'd just crossed the living room, glanced out the window, and, and for some reason, one of the big stags, his whole body language, thinking back, something stopped me and maybe look at him. How uh, old are you at this point? I was 11 years old. Okay. And, and you could see the way the big stag recoiled back. And then the next thing, I just saw the flash of him crossing the window. And uh, he just made a headlong attack at my father. And in the first couple of minutes, the first blow, he struck him on the side of the head and it practically scalped him. And then at that time, the brow tine went through the cheek of his backside and the stag ran him into the wall. And my father was a big, strong guy. He's about six foot two and uh, heavily built. And I can remember to this day watching the stag shaking him like a handkerchief, just waving him back and forward. And this has been an animal that he'd 
been feeding and had a... Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Re, I say inverted commas, a relationship with... Yes, yeah, I'd known the stag for years. And uh, the stag, at that stage, it appeared the stag was intent on killing him. And then the stag pushed him down and pushed him along the ground. And again, you could see the tines disappearing into the, into the bone and into the, into the flesh. You saw the antlers, the tine disappear into his leg. When was your dad screaming? Or? Oh, my God, yeah. yeah. Could he, well, more roaring than screaming, as I recall. <laughs> but uh, So I changed direction and started back through the house toward the gun room. And uh, there was an old BSA, believe it or not, an old BSA Majestic 243, and it had an old Bushnell scope in it in the gun room. And, and thankfully, it wasn't like it is now, where everything had to be locked away and bolts separated. The rifle was literally in the gun room where it had been left to dry, so it was lying across the arms of the couch. And uh, I picked the rifle up, grabbed a handful of bullets and started to put the bullets into the rifle, making my way towards the back door. At which point I met my mother, who was hysterical about the whole thing, but trying to prevent me getting out the door with the rifle for fear of shooting my father. And I, and I, and I, <laughs> I, I, point, really. I can understand her logic. <laughs> but what else were we to do? And I, and I remember to, we had an old uh, Ford Escort car and I can remember loading the rifle putting my elbow on the bonnet of the rifle and looking through the scope and I could see the stag of my father, the stag of my father. And, uh, I mean, I'm going well back in memory now, but it crossed my mind that there was no way I could shoot at it from that distance. So I just hatched upon the idea of walking into the stag. And I walked in from about here to the camera, at which point I saw the stag start to notice me and start to turn. So I stepped forward, put the barrel against the stag's neck and pulled the trigger. And as a kid, I mean, the, the flip of the rifle fairly pushed me back, but the stag dropped instantly. To the, I mean, the bullet smashed his neck and the stag collapsed. And my father said to this day, though by that stage he was barely conscious, mm. he was aware of the wallop of the rifle going through the deer. Wow, he could feel that? Yes, he said he felt the thump go right through the deer when the, when the bullet struck it. Wow. And the big stag collapsed, um, at which point my mother, who was a nurse at that time, she was on the scene instantly. And we managed to disconnect him from the stag, which took a bit of doing. He was dead, the stag was over 25 stone. So he'd been, uh, he'd come from sort of Kenworth Park blood, so a big lump of an animal. So we managed to get him off the stag and away to the doctors in uh, the village of Tongue. How many sort of puncture wounds did he have? I can't, to be honest, I can't remember the number of stitches of that now, but there were certainly several. Like I say, the top of his head was opened up. Uh, he had definitely a big wound in, in his, in his, basically in his backside, yeah, yeah. and a big stab in his thigh, and his hands were holed as well. Wow. And 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 in thinking back, the whole attack, I would have said the whole the whole attack wouldn't have gone on as long as ten minutes. I would have said it would have been five six minutes maximum. That must have felt like a. But to him, it probably felt like an eternity. <laughs> and, I, and I can remember my older brother phoning up that night and saying, "You fool, you missed." <laughs> <laughs> on that bombshell I'm just going to make sure I press record because it's okay. story, I've just got a horrible feeling I did yeah it's always helpful say so one two three again one two three okay I didn't want to make sure that make sure we got that story so oh my goodness so at that point you were 11 years of age obviously your father was involved with, with deer but had it sort of got in your soul at this point? I mean, absolutely. I, I can remember, I mean, one of my first memories as a kid was on uh, Lord Thurso's estate at uh, Dalnawellan in Caithness. And uh, it was the fascination as a wee boy. And I, I must have been five, six years of age, maybe younger, remembering the deer ponies coming home. Yeah. Uh, and it was, I think, a great excitement to be out in the courtyard when the horses came in loaded with the stags. And uh, never really particularly worried about it. I used to walk under the horses. So that, that was sort of the height I was. So you'd be inspecting the stag and the saddle, and you could literally walk under the horse to do it. And uh, I think then I'd had the bug, and uh, I remember my father taking me in, in a rucksack to the hill. So I, you may make it sound as if you're a really small child. I wasn't well. <laughs> going under a well, ponies going in rucks. Well, I mean, I, I was at that stage. You know, I kind of I've put on a bit of weight since then. But no, I can remember. I can genuinely remember stalking deer with him from when I was a, a nipper. Certainly before I was eleven. By the time I was eleven, I'd already shot deer. I shot my first deer when I was uh, nine years of age, and it wasn't uncommon at that stage. Did you? get it at, at nine is that you know you see certainly more in the, I suppose in the states when you see sort of children holding weapons and things but maybe that was just more of our culture at that point or certainly a country child 
would be sort of witness to that sort of thing? Well, I think, I mean, that particular animal, it, the, it had been raiding the, the lodge garden and eating the potatoes. So it's personal. And uh, I was basically tasked when the thing turned up, shoot it. All right, because he dabs at work. Or... Yeah, they were, oh, out, okay. they, they were out on the hill stalking, and yeah, I, yeah. As, as chance would have it, I cleaned the kennels, went and looked into the garden, and much to my delight, <laughs> there he was. <laughs> so I, so I, I took it as my cue. <laughs> if, you're the, if, if you're there, it's got to be done. So I, I remember to this day shooting him and uh, going and getting a wheelbarrow and tipping him into the wheelbarrow and managing to get the wheelbarrow up on its wheels and then taking him to the larder. Wow. So by the time they got home, it wasn't the best bit of lardering I'd ever done, but I'd managed to larder the thing and it was hung up. Wow. Wow. So, but the thing is that, you know, I've, I've filmed with your your brother Robbie as well, so, you know, it, it's part of the Roundtree DNA then, isn't it, this, the, this whole deer thing? I think so, yes. I mean, certainly, we, we were, I mean, we were fortunate that we were brought up in a, in a, in a terrific environment. I mean, if you can complain about as a childhood eating salmon, venison and lobsters and having to go and fish a salmon river and to get a few fish for the lodge, then what a terrible time we had. Yeah? And uh, we were brought up uh, in the sort of the early 70s. Uh, and right, and in that time, deer stalking had become fashionable for European clients, but this, the traditional Scottish estate was still very much a family affair in form of ownership and in people that worked in it. So there was there was a tradition of father to son, father to son, all the way through. So some families had basically been together for generations. I mean, it, it was very clear when you when you listen to sort of the, the older people talking about it, like so when they went to war, very often the, the laird and the gillies ended up together. And uh, they'd worked together, they'd hunted together. They had quite a close relationship. Mm. And the estates that we were brought up on, we were, I mean, the Moncrief family and uh, the Sinklers, Lord Thurso's family, they, they treated their staff like a larger family, like a wider family. At, at the end of the season when they had a gathering or at Christmas time the, or, or New Year, they very much looked on their staff as their wider family. And, and I think this is a thing that's been lost in, in people's you know, impression of Highland estates. There's a modern thought now that uh, there were the subjugated serfs and, and the, the arrogant la lairds. Mm. And nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, I, I can think of a dozen stories where the family that owned the estate paid to put the keepers, stalkers or shepherd's kids through school and through university and actually encouraged them on their way to successful kind of lives. And we had the same. So, I mean, when they weren't there, we had the run of the place. So we fished the laird's bait on the river, often with the laird's rod. <laughs> and, and, and we stocked his stags and we used his horses to bring them home. And uh, they didn't expect anything different. Isn't it strange, though, that you, you sort of perceive that as a class thing? Well, actually, it's just employer, employee, but living in the same place. So they have a, 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 a closer relationship. So the idea of looking upon this as sort of being, as you say, almost like downtrodden. I mean, it sounded like an incredible lifestyle that, and I imagine you had a lot of fun and your father appreciated what he had. Well, I, I think for me, doing what I do now and looking at what my father did and what his family did before him, what's increasingly aware now is we now live in a, in a world where everybody's much more economically conscious. And, and uh, I, I think the traditional Highland estate then wasn't looked upon as a thing that made money. It, it was looked upon purely as a thing that uh, the people did. I mean, the, the, I think we talked about this last year. I mean, the Highland Estate was the super yacht of its day. Mm. It wasn't what you were trying to make. It was what you could afford to lose. And, and, and there was a degree of benevolence from wealthy, successful businessmen that cascaded through entire communities. You have it here at Ardnamurchan where you can see where schools were built and doctor's houses were built and access was built. That's still uh, happening now, though. Well, absolutely. I mean, the, ma the, the man that owns the estate we're sat on at the moment, his personal commitment to the community is incredible. I mean, uh, when I first got involved here, it would be 23, 24 years ago this year, the, the estate employed four people. Now it employs over 50. It has a whiskey distillery. It's right up at the front end and it's renewable energy. It supports local fish farming initiatives. It's got a sustainable farm. We've got a deer operation. We're sat here in the deer park. And uh, the deer park we have now is very different to the deer park that was here in the 1890s. And all of these things create low carbon food, employment, a visitor experience. I mean, I think what we offer now, and maybe what's missing in a lot of people's lives is adventure. Maybe the word that's missing 
is the adventure. And the advantage we had as kids, to go right back to the childhood thing, is right up to the time we left school. In fact, to this day, it was an adventure. I think adventure means that you almost have no time constraints, whereas now there's so many time constraints that your adventure has to be over, like, 24 hours. Your adventure has to exist over the weekend, otherwise it doesn't exist at all. Well, I, I agree with that too, David. I mean, the, the trouble is that everybody thought technology was going to make our lives easier. It's turned us into slaves. And uh, it, it's a difficult thing now. I mean, it, almost when you take people stalking now and you're guiding them, it's worth saying to them in the early part of the day, if you can do without your electronic equipment today, turn it off and please try. <laughs> because nothing's You're offering more... therapy. Well, I mean, there's nothing more frustrating than spending five or six hours trying to get cl close to a stag and just in time for somebody to get their WhatsApp message. Exactly. I've That's seen that. people, you know, halfway through their stock say, no, sorry, I, I can't continue, I, I have to take this call. And, and you're thinking, what's happened in their life when it's got to be like that? Does that upset your flow? A little, but I think for them it's quite sad too. Mm. I mean, I, I, a lot of these people have been very successful in what they do. Mm but they're still hostage to, yeah. to the world they're part of. You mentioned then about how suddenly you were seeing European clients coming over and, and hunting in the sort of 70s, 80s. How much has it evolved? I mean, I, I know that you have a lot of American clients, for example, but is that is that true of the whole industry? Are we just seeing a lot of globetrotting going on? I, I think that there, there's obviously iconic figures, some of which you, you've met with me, and, and they influenced the way that we've developed the business a lot over the years. I mean, I, I remember, I mean, terrific characters like Peter Swales. Uh, I mean, Peter and John Ormerson many years ago established a thing called Sport in Scotland. And, and I can remember as a youngster that to everybody aspired to be involved with Sport in Scotland because they were where it was at. They had their shop at Market Bray in Inverness. And at one point, I think they must have had access to about 150 Scottish estates which was, at its time, was, was, was totally influential to the market. It changed everything. And I, and I think these characters, and any way you go in life, it's not just time and technology. The individuals stand out. And I think uh, Pete was probably one of the, the sort of the fathers of taking it where it is today, where they actually made a product available uh, and stimulated a demand from people that had an interest. Mm. And in that, it's probably not changed. Prices involved have changed. I mean, when you think about it, in the 1970s, it cost you £150 to shoot a stag, and a mini car cost £800 to buy new. And uh, these days, to, I mean, to shoot a decent stag will cost you upwards of £1,000. And I think the world market understands that better than our market does. Mm. Because the, the, the parity and change in cost has maybe been one of the most significant changes. Now, I find it interesting when I'm talking to you, when you talk about... Um you making this into a successful business, uh, producing good animals that people pay top dollar for, which also then means that there's a, a certain element of exclusivity which you've just touched on. But then, on the other hand, you're also talking about getting the man in the street to be out hunting and being able to take animals on public land. So you see that there's opportunities for those that do have a bit of cash and those that are just... Joe Bloggs? I think what's increasingly apparent to me, in it, and it's probably worth saying for people that have kind of just joined, in, joined us in this, I, I spent uh, about 12 years of my career working for and with government. And uh, the last job I held for the government, I was uh, Chief Ranger in uh, what's now more or less the core of Loch Lomond and Trossos National Park. So when, when I went there, it was Aberfoyle Forest District and Cowell Forest District. And then it, it developed into Lomond and Trossachs. And, and what became apparent to me then, very early on in the whole process, was that the average guy on the street had been disconnected from his land. And, and I think a lot of people, when they look at the public estate, they forget that they're the public. And, and I think that's... And everything that's being debated at the moment, there are political agendas at stake. There are definitely some people that you could almost use the term brave heart politics that are very keen to, to see a Scotland that predates the... The, the lairds, but then they'd only go back to a feudal system which wasn't desperately dissimilar. Uh, and uh, there's a little bit of uh, more passion than economic reality. And, and I think it's not a case of the, the working man has been disconnected, therefore it's some way his fault. I think the whole bottom line of this is that the disconnect of the working man is a, tra is a tragic loss to our environment. 
Because the working man on the street, he should be able to feed himself from natural resources. If you look at the bulk of the British people, they have a huge culture in hunting. And I mean, it goes right, it's, it's woven through every element of our society, our heraldry, our storytelling, our history. So it, it seems odd that we have this in our culture and we've been such a, an outward going nation over so long. The, the public man, the guy on the street, doesn't have access to public land. And, and I don't see it in any way as a threat to what we're sitting on here. Because I would, I would suggest to you that if the average guy on the street had time and opportunity to, to hunt on public land, as happens in other parts of the world, then at some stage he would probably aspire to come and join us and take one or two decent stags in his life anyway. Mm. And, and I think we have a huge role to be able to play, to use a wonderful modern term, upskilling. And you can look at me going, what do you mean by that? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, I know what you mean. <laughs> and, and basically to take guys out here and say, these are the basic skills. And, and I think, and an awful lot of people that are your viewers have been excellent in the fact that if not that long ago, government turned around and said there needs to be a competent standard in this country. Let's aspire to it voluntarily. Mm. And the majority of people have. Mm. And they've got a huge passion. The fact that they, they watch a lot of the stuff that you produce and they're really interested they're interested because they want to broaden their knowledge and their understanding, which makes them more competent to manage their natural resources. So I, I, I think if I could send one message to people more than anything else, when you think public land, just think in your heart that it's yours. Because it is. Because your ancestors fought and defended it in two world wars, and uh, all of you have paid tax to maintain it the way it is. Mm. So why shouldn't you access it? And it's, it's strange that it's okay to do it by canoe, by mountain bike, by parachute, but for some reason to strap your rifle on your back, take your son and daughter with you and say, come on, let's go and fill the freezer for Christmas, it seems abhorrent. And, and I think that there needs to be a clear message from the guy on the street to the people they elect, give us our land back and let us access and use it the way our ancestors did. You'd like to start a revolution, don't you? I'd like to go and get a Christmas tree for Christmas, let alone get some meat for the freezer. Well, I, I'll tell you a funny story about that. Many years ago, talking about getting Christmas trees, I remember driving on the edge of a forestry plantation and watching trees falling over. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I thought, aye, aye, there's something going on here. So I pulled the pickup in at the road and sat and watched for a while and saw this, this gentleman lugging pine trees to the roadside, putting them in the boot of his car and tying them on the roof. So when I reported him to the police, I was somewhat disappointed to find out he was in fact the local minister. <laughs> <laughs> Who had considered it, work. well, he'd considered it his charitable act to fell public trees to give to people that couldn't afford them. There we go. So maybe he was the ultimate sort of Christmas tree Robin Hood. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've just come back from uh, New Zealand. Uh, an opportunity to go and see what they do over there. They're known for their, well, it's been termed monster reds, Frankenstein reds. Um, it was a real sort of fact-finding mission for you, wasn't it? Because obviously, maybe people don't realise that, um, as far as New Zealand's concerned, they had two endemic mammals. That was it. They had a, they've got a, a fur seal and a bat, I think, was what mm -hmm. they actually, the Lord provided them with, staying with a sort of uh, the, the God message. Um, but then... Mammals are introduced, including tar, chamois, and the reds. But the reds that have taken over there have an incredible story, and they've developed into these these mega beasts, really. Mm -hmm. But what we discovered pretty much was they've just the, the potential's there, and that New Zealand's delivered on it. I, I think that for me, what was really fascinating about New Zealand was, a, and I think the more you get into deer, the more you realise it's a people story. And uh, I think New Zealand is probably the ultimate deer people story. And uh, what fascinated me, and, and behind us, if you look in the distance here, are the Morvan Hills. So uh, you and I stopped at uh, the Landis Pass where uh, red deer were turned loose in an area they call the Morvan Hills. Now, th these deer originated from Invermark. And to me, it was fascinating to be able to go and experience so much of what I'd read about. And... Uh, these deer didn't just suddenly turn up and do well. People made a conscious effort to actually create a, an environment for them to do well. And they set uh, acclimatisation societies up to be able to make sure they succeeded in this. And, I, and I'm sure in, the, in their vision at that time, it was the idea of creating the, the ultimate gentleman's sporting paradise. 
for the whole of New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, and, 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 and our travels, that came across very clearly. I mean, we both saw that. They were, I mean, if you're, if you're into your field sports, it must have been the closest thing to going to heaven. Mm. I mean, the, the rivers were full of enormous trout. Mm. The mountains were full of, of, of deer and the high mountains were full of tar and chamois. What more could, what more could a guy have asked for? Where they probably went wrong, in fact, we know they went wrong, is that uh, having created uh, this pool of mammals in an environment that, where they had no, com- no competition and no predation, what happened next was quite a remarkable story. And you think that over the, from 1870 to about 1900 and something, I think there was about 250 animals introduced. And from what we saw, that population got upwards of a million. Then... Uh, it's quite, it's quite significant. And, it, and what, to me, was a great story about people was that, first of all, it was, the, it was the preserve of those who could afford it. Then they went to being a national threat, where they thought that the environment of New Zealand was going to be damaged permanently by this introduction, to suddenly inspiring people like Tim Wallace. And, uh, and uh, I thought that was just incredible, that story. <laughs> there you go. I mean, there's, there's a guy that thought, I need a helicopter. <laughs> Uh, and fair play to him, off he went. And uh, the story that followed, but it, it's a story of people and tenacity and, and they developed a venison industry. From the back of that develop, of development, they moved into a deer farming industry. They ended up with uh, huge numbers of deer behind the wire and an international market. And, and there's things that I've come back and thought, oh my goodness, why haven't we done this? I don't know about you, you saw me standing staring at that little bottle of uh, deer sinew pet tablets. Yeah. And just half of the stuff that we threw in the dustbin last night, the New Zealanders make something of. Mm. And, and I think it's, for me, it was very much a story. We met the Fraser family out there, uh, and we know Frasers from our travels in Scotland. And, and I think the whole sort of Highland 51st war cry of Caberfe Gubra probably sums New Zealand for me in a nutshell. The horn of the deer forever. And just about every possible way, they've, they've, they've taken their deer farming to a level that was quite breathtaking. But also the fact that they're celebrating Tim Wallace to the extent they've got half of a museum dedicated to him. So yes. we've got all these elements, we've got all the history behind how he developed the industry and the helicopters, the, the, the capture nets, all these different strategies he uh, developed and employed. But that, what he did then is then now spread across the world, isn't it? Well, I mean, a lot of the technology that we talk about now, that the New Zealanders, and, and I think we've got to remember the New Zealanders, I mean, grateful of the fact that many of them basically are, are, well, we, we're the same people as you and I. There's Welshmen, Scotsmen, Englishmen. They're just massive. Yeah, yeah, they, everything seems to be bigger there, including <laughs> the, the Kiwis, yeah. No wonder they win at rugby so often. But, I mean, that came across too. But it, to me, it, it's, it, it's an inspiration of what people can do, I think, given the right atmosphere to do it in. And, and I think the thing that stood out for you and I, and you commented on it a couple of times, is that there was a museum there that had photographs of deer slung under a helicopter or people actually jumping out of a helicopter and grabbing a deer. And, and we almost live in a society now in this country where we're scared to even say these things happen. Mm. They, there's a passion for everything they did there and there's almost an embarrassment as to what we do here. They were celebrating it. Yes, and I, and I think that's a, a message that we have to get across to the guy in the street, that, that keepers, stalkers, shepherds, farmers, these people are the champions of the land. How do we reconnect? Well, I think it takes us back to what we were talking about 10 minutes ago. I, at the moment, I think people, particularly folk that, that are urban, and I don't mean that in any critical way at all, they don't have a natural connection to the land because there's no opportunity for them. I mean, it would probably be worth canvassing a number of your listeners and viewers and saying, how many of you have a passion to access the land, to feed yourself from fishing or hunting and find it impossible to get an opportunity? That would be a really interesting figure to go to government with. I know, we have, particularly in Scotland, we have a government saying that everybody should be fitter, healthier, greener, fairer. Well, why aren't we creating these opportunities? One of the biggest problems is that we have with people coming, writing in or emailing or whatever is access to land, access, you know, permissions. How do I get permissions? You know, a lot of it is down to working alongside farmers and speaking to farmers and trying to get that, build that relationship where they're doing pest control and there may be opportunity of doing the pigeons. You know, there's a lot of work that goes in, but access to, to open ground and public ground um, is just something that people, it's not in the culture anymore. Well, there's a, there's a disconnect. And, and I mean, the disconnect goes right back to William the Conqueror, if not before, that, uh, that the preserve of sport was seen to be elite and class heavy 
and the man on the street couldn't access it. And I think, I mean, New Zealand was classic for you and I. I mean, we were travelling along speaking to Duncan and Duncan regaled us with the fact that uh, it's perfectly possible on Department of Conservation ground for somebody that's a non-New Zealand resident to get a permission and go off into the hinterland and hunt. Mm. Now, it seems to me a little odd that you can fly, <laughs> you know, a, a, we could take a man off the street anywhere in this country and he could fly halfway around the world, get off an airplane and be deemed competent with, a, with a, a little bit of skills demonstration to go and hunt in some of the most treacherous wild land I've ever seen. But uh, if they said to you, can I nip into the forest of Dean or the new forest and, and hunt a fallow deer from a freezer, that there'd be a public outcry. That's because it's really dangerous now. Well, th this is the thing, again, I mean, anybody that's got a government role listening, I, I honestly think they, they need to give some serious thought to the position they take on this. Well, Charlie always uses that um, uh, ping pong is more, has had more serious accidents than hunting. Well, uh, the, whole, uh, the whole concept is that you have a, a gun and a knife, therefore you're dangerous. Because public, the public at large perceive weapons as connected to violent crime. And tragically, there are some awful things going on, particularly in recent months and, and years, involving weapons and violent crime, which none of us, uh, none of us can support or, or condone. We think, it, we think it's, it's, it's awful. But that doesn't mean that the guy that wants to go and fill his freezer and has demonstrated a basic level of skill, shouldn't be entitled to do so. They're two entirely different things. I mean, there's very, very few sporting firearms used in criminal activity. Mm. And I think Charlie's made that point. There's only a tiny percentage, and, they, and only because they've ended up in the wrong hands. Mm. So, so that there's, no, there's no basis for this. And I think that, for me, the, the interesting thing in, in, in north of the border, more so than the south, is that we have a government that's driving land reform agendas and there's desire to break up large areas of land and, and settle it upon more people in smaller parcels. Well, it, it's inconceivable that this is possible without a wider number of people accessing firearms because people will need to carry out crop protection. They'll, they'll legitimately have the, the requirement to uh, control uh, un, animal numbers. And uh, I'm afraid the idea that large predators are somehow going to fill this niche is pie in the sky. Let's talk about one of your favourite subjects. Let's talk about rewilding and how we will there we will be um, dancing our way through the woodlands with wild boar, maybe a maybe a wolf nibbling at our ankles, you know, and maybe a lynx mm -hmm. jumping from bough to bough above us. I mean, this is nonsense, isn't it? I, I think that, that we've got to go back to what triggers a lot of people's thinking on this. And uh, there's some very learned characters who write in some of the 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 UK press or appear on different websites and blogs that, that have a very strong opinion that what is actually my home, where we're sat at the moment and where a lot of the people that are my neighbours live and make a living, should somehow be a wilderness, that mankind should disconnect from it and in so doing they will rekindle their spirit. And uh, I struggle to see how a country that's soon going to have almost 80 million of a population is going to manage to depopulate large areas of this country to create a wilderness that, that can't exist on the scale of a little country like Scotland without having colossal impact on other land use interests. I mean, it, people talk about uh, releasing wolves in the highlands to control red deer numbers. When uh, the, the sheep flocks in, in, in the mountain areas of Scotland that are unguarded at night outnumber the deer by at least 20 to 1. So the idea that you're going, to put, pickings. you're going to put a 10 stone dug out there that's intelligent, highly intelligent. I mean, I've hunted wolves and wolves are intelligent. And th that somehow the, the wolf is going to differentiate between an easy meal of a sheep and pursuing a red deer hind. Mm. And the, the, if, the, if what's happened with the sea eagle is any lesson for us, then uh, the suggestion that alternative measures and compensation is going to cover the, the farmer's losses. It, it's nothing short of hilarious. I mean, we spent part of the year this year watching a rubber eagle, a rubber dummy inflating itself and try and keep uh, eagles out of ramen <laughs> parks. That will be on the show very yeah. soon, but it is. It also made a noise, didn't he? This inflatable. Yeah. It's like, um, how would you describe him? Just an inflatable doll. Yeah, it looked almost an orange like. Orange inflatable yeah. doll. Yes, yeah. It looked like, like around. a large marigold glove with flashing yes. lights. I mean, it, it was. I mean, the, did you see an eagle's? 
flying anywhere near it? Well, I watched an eagle fly past it with a bit of a disdain, but it was carrying... It, was, it, <laughs> it didn't look terrified. No, it was carrying a lamb at the time. So <laughs> it, 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 it was obviously confused as to what this... Was it, was it some kind of road marker or...? <laughs> Guiding him in. But, <laughs> They're but, over here. <laughs> but I think the worrying thing was that the, the the crofters were looking at these inflatable rubber devices, probably more confused than the eagles were. Uh, and and when, I mean, who thought that was a good? Like, where's the consultation here? It's like if you get a big orange flappy man that inflates and makes a noise, that is going to deter a apex predator from coming in and doing its business. Who thinks it's basically ruling the roost anyway. I mean, he, you know, he doesn't care. He's big and he's angry and he's got sharp bits. Well, I mean, the, 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 the whole background to my mind with it, David, is that uh, when they came up with the idea of this reintroduction, the, the, it was a bit like taking Red Deer to New Zealand. They thought this is going to be a great, great idea and it's going to work. And now it has worked, but nobody actually thought about mitigating the impacts of when it did work. And this is kind of where we are at the moment. So we, we live in a country where there is absolutely no chance, I think, in the moment that you could convince the public in this country that there could or would be any reason long term for controlling eagle numbers to prevent impact on agriculture. And I think the immediate response from the public would be almost straight away that uh, we pay the farmers a subsidy, therefore they do what we tell them. Whereas the basis of subsidy and agricultural support, this side of Brexit, and who knows what Brexit holds, was to, to make the cost of food to the man and woman on the street when they go to the local shop easier to afford. And uh, these are two very different things. And, and that's what worries me. I mean, it, 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 there's no sensible long-term plan. And they, at the moment, they're struggling to find one. And I think it takes us back to, you said to me, what do you think about rewilding? Well, I think in the Highlands of Scotland, there are two uh, very much clashing uh, visions. There's a vision of uh, smaller scale land ownership. There's a vision of greater community involvement. There's a vision of more inclusion for all. And uh, at the same time, there's a government offering to people that want to rewild that there is going to be an ability to rewild parts of Scotland at the landscape scale. And I don't know how there's room for both. How, do it, how does it pay? You know, you've got to have all these tourists flocking to see a really, really shy lynx that you won't be able to see because he's tucked away? Well, you and I have both been in lynx areas on a number of occasions. I've glimpsed one once. I've never seen a lynx. But perhaps it's a bit like uh, the oak trees in Ascent, that uh, be like chicken flavoured crisps. You know, that they don't actually have to be there to, uh, to, kindle, <laughs> to kindle that excitement. Can I also just add, the re if people are listening to this and the idea of the fish eagle with the lamb, there's a reason for the fish eagle going for the lambs because they're rich pickings at certain times of year, but also there's no fish here. Well, I mean, it, this debate was, again, I had a quite an interesting discussion with a guy recently, and, and we've been fortunate enough that uh, the guys, and, I, and I'm not criticising the local people on the ground that are the Sea Eagle officers at all. I think uh, they're passionate, they're knowledgeable, they're doing their best, but they're aware that there are some issues they're struggling to deal with. And when we go into the nests and look and see what's in it, then it's pretty indicative that the, that the eagle is an opportunist and he's taking what he can get. Any fish bones in that? Uh, we didn't find a lot. I mean, but I'd be, I'd be totally unfair if I didn't say we found some. Chicken? Uh, we, we, found, we found some really interesting things. And, uh, Go on. It was things, there was dogfish, there were parts of lambs, there were the odd bit of deer, there was a bit of fox on one occasion. Mm. So it, it demonstrated <clears throat> that the eagle will have a go at most things. But I think the key to it is that in the numbers of eagles we've got, with the fact that, yes, fish stocks have declined, you only have to go to the fishing port of Malik to realise that there's about a quarter of the number of the boats that used to be in there. And uh, the eagle is an opportunist. He'll take what comes his way. And when they're rearing chicks, they need fresh prey. Probably for them, the lamb isn't the best thing for their diet. <coughs> and, where, and where they get them, they don't necessarily do that well on them. But... Uh, it's a conflict that needs to be resolved as the population expands. You manage what is regarded as an iconic species across the planet. Do you think it's given um, due credit? I think, uh, to put that in context again, I mean, as, as I get older, maybe it's an old age thing, you, you feel that you get more interested in history. Mm. And I think to, to know where you want to go, you have to get your head around where you've come from. 
And, and I've made the point, and this isn't very much a purely a Scottish thing or a Highland thing. I think the, the British people per se have a, have a strong tradition in, in hunting and hunting practices. And I, and I think the problem we had or have is we've gone through a period of time where things like red grouse, Atlantic salmon and red deer are seen as, as, as the possessions of wealth. And because of that, I think uh, deer find themselves frequently in a situation where they are demonised. And uh, I remember... Because of the company they supposedly keep. Yes, because of who they, they, they kind of hang out with. I remember many years ago, uh, the BBC putting out a programme not long after SNH had set about uh, its mission on Craig Meggie. And the programme was titled Deer, the Plague of the Glen. And for many of us, we viewed that as a turning point in an effort to readdress public perception of our largest wild mammal. And it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I don't just run a, a hunting business, I run a wildlife tourism business as well. And if you drive past a field with 40 sheep in it, people don't say a thing. <laughs> if you drive past a field with 40 deer in it, nine times out of 10, you'll get a comment, oh my goodness, there must be far too many deer here. Are they a problem? So in fairness to those who wanted to bring about change, they've been hugely successful in misrepresenting our largest wild mammal. Now, uh, by saying that, I mean, I've shot huge numbers of deer. There'll be people listening uh, and watching me here thinking, uh, you've probably pulled a trigger on more deer than most. And uh, in my defence, I would say there were areas that we did shoot huge numbers of deer where the reductions needed to be made. But the whole thing about resource management is balancing it with the ability of the land to sustain it and the ability to deliver your objectives. And, and I think for any of our natural resources, we have to get away from the demonising of things. And, and particularly, I think now more in England than Scotland, people have a perception of this idea that the deer are a problem. And uh, I spend a bit of time in the South uh, and from time to time. And the thing that fascinates me is they talk about deer and RTAs. Mm. I was shocked at, just before daylight in the morning when, the, when literally sleepy rural England explodes into life. And just about every country lane has got lines of cars hurtling down it, heading toward the city. And then people crash into deer and you wonder why. When the creature is going about its normal daily routine of being out morning and evening and making its way back to cover, it ends up on a high-sided lane and gets scalped. So maybe there's more to how we live in the countryside than purely blaming deer. Fair point. Fair point. Another fascinating thing that you mentioned when I was up here the first time, because all the, all the cows around here were enjoying um, licking roads, and I, and I was intrigued to know why, but then that then leads into the RTA system as well, because I didn't realise what we stick with our grit. Well, uh, th there's things that go on that... Uh, I remember years ago, again, when I was still with the Forestry Commission, and they were planting, uh, I have to use the correct term, the Millennium, Millennium Forest Scotland, and was also known as uh, the Pitts District. Now, <laughs> what was really quite interesting is where they wanted to establish woodland. And I remember meeting with some of the forestry guys and local council guys and uh, making the point to them, you know, that if you create this uh, environmental Valhalla for a browser, don't be surprised if they populate it. So if you plant woodlands up and down the side of major carriageways, then maintain the grass short and sweet, and then in the winter time, just to make matters worse, you spray salt, which you've actually encased in molasses, up and down the roadside verge. Don't be entirely shocked if deer end up there. And uh, it seems to have gone on. And, and I mean, we, you see it in places like Glencoe, where they spray molasses encased salt up and down the road. And the reason they do it is to stop the, the actual salt breaking down so it's still effective when vehicles grind it into the road surface. But as you saw yourself with the cattle and with the deer, that's why they're on the road licking the road. Sugar. It's uh, the sugar and the salt, both of which they require. And uh, it, Genius. It, well, it's interesting. It fascinates me because I mean, when I was in Canada not so long ago, I noticed these uh, wildlife bridges over the road. And uh, you see it in uh, the Netherlands as well, where wildlife can travel back and forward safely over the road. We don't seem to have that in our culture in this country. If they in any way interfere with our day-to-day -day existence, the immediate, the immediate solution is to shoot them. So what do they expect to do what, uh, to, to populate the, the woodland then? Just people? 
So you create a woodland and people would enjoy it. So the wildlife wasn't part and parcel of the uh, the bigger picture. I, I think. Uh, I mean, I think it would be naive to think people that, that set about designing these things were that stupid. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but I think that there is a, there is a perception of of the vision they want to create. And, uh, but who are they putting first? They're putting people first before they're putting wildlife. I there. think they're probably putting environment and the type of environment they seek to create first. And then there are things that attach themselves to it, which they didn't quite allow for. Nobody expected the road air population around the urban areas of Glasgow and uh, Ayrshire to expand as they created a green lung. But to any of us, you'd think it was the, the outcome they sought. Yeah, I, I can remember years ago going to Mugduck Country Park, and meeting the rangers there. And uh, I honestly, I, I it was a welfare issue. I don't think I'd ever seen so many road deer in such a small space in my life. And uh, the population was a ridiculously high level, and it brought to a head all of the questions about what we do with urban deer. And uh, I had a lot of seduced suggestions, some of which fell on stony ground. I mean, I, I thought it was an incredible theatre to develop uh, competency for bow hunting. Because <laughs> you do, you do like mixing it up. Well, uh, well, I mean, you like bow hunting as well, though, well, don't you? Well, I've, I've done a fair bit of it, yeah, and, yeah. And, and all I would say is those <laughs> that practice it and are competent at it yeah. demonstrate a higher level of skill, I believe, than people that use rifles and shotguns. Oh, yeah, I, I love it. I love filming it. I don't get enough opportunities to do it. And, but I think, like anything, is provided standards are, 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 are adhered to, there's no reason why. And what I liked about it is that close to where people are out walking their dogs, playing with their kids, <clears throat> playing football, the idea that in an area where a bow can be effectively used, there's no risk to public safety, there's, yeah. no, there's no noise pollution of the activity, there's no disturbance. And I, and I think uh, it would provide an opportunity with tree stands and blinds and hides where, again, the man on the street, as we talked about earlier, could harvest food for his own table. What's Nicola think about this? I, well, unfortunately, in a minute, you and I have both tried recently to speak to some of the hierarchy of uh, Scottish natural heritage <coughs> to talk some of these things over and to find out what their position is. They won't talk to us, will they? And at the moment, we're, we're getting very little in the way of responses. Which is a shame. It's a shame. But I think uh, if they take what they've aspired to, which is greener, fairer, healthier, then this has surely got to be a natural step forward. Why are we spending more than £6 million a, day, a, a year culling deer on the public estate when there is literally an army of people in this country willing to go and do it for nothing? Do you think there is? Yes, without a doubt, absolutely. And I think you would kindle enthusiasm. There are already people that are pressing to do it. You only have to look at things... Uh, and I mean, Ian Ferguson, that used to be a colleague of mine, has run an excellent scheme on the island of Arran with BASC for a number of years. And... Uh, I think Ian's inundated with people that are trying to do it and want to do it. And uh, it's probably a model that could be developed. And if we look at the, the thing that we discussed in the Forestry Commission years ago was having rangers, having ranger helpers. And these would offset the cost of rangers, which means we could have employed people embedded in communities who actually worked with the community to, to achieve high standards of deer management rather than having contractors. And I, I, for part of my career, was a deer management contractor, so I'm not having a pot shot at contractors. But I think we want local produce, locally harvested, prepared and sold locally, that involve the community. And that's a struggle for contractors to fit in that one. But those are all buzzwords that you know, everyone's talking about. You know, people want good food, they want locally sourced food, they want the story behind the food, and that delivers on everything. Absolutely. And I, and I think it, it's interesting, and I, I said this to you the other day, that the deer management in, in Scotland has been quite a contentious issue discussed at some length, and there have been a number of re reviews. So there were two reviews in the last century, but that was over a period of almost 50 years. Right. And we're about to have two reviews in the management of deer on private land in less than three years. So they didn't get it right the first time? I think that, again, there's an agenda at stake that, that worries me. That uh, I mean, here we are overlooking Loch Sunert, and the government at the moment is paying contractors to do habitat ass assessments here to try and assure that the, the private landowners are delivering on the public benefit. Right. If we look at the public land in the same area, there isn't this level of monitoring going on. And uh, so there's, there's limited resources for them to meet any level of compliance. 
So they are seeking a higher standard of performance, I would suggest, from private landowners on a voluntary basis than they are from public servants on a paid-for basis. So they need to get their own house in order before they start looking elsewhere, do you think? Well, I, I think so. I mean, at the end of the day, they, they, they wrote a report not too long ago assessing how things like the Forestry Commission had performed and pointed the finger at uh, private landowners for creating a problem that uh, they were struggling to deal with using taxpayers' money. I'm afraid if you go today to places like the north of Mull, the, you'll see that most of the deer that are mobile now on private land are coming off public land and they're doing so on a dawn and dusk basis. In my time with the Forestry Commission, I observed that in a number of areas. I mean, certainly when I first went to Loch Lomond, to Queen Elizabeth Forest Park, the public land was the net exporter. People were harvesting deer that were coming off the public estate. But it, this isn't me trying to draw a line in the sand and point the finger at them. This is me saying that there is an opportunity here to come together. Mm. Uh, and to look at solutions that work. And that's what came across for me in New Zealand, and it's what comes across in North America. That uh, the management of deer on, on state or public land involves the public. And I think we need that desperately here. If we're going to review deer management in, private, in the private estates, and don't get me wrong, I'm not poo-pooing the public interest, I think we need to have a clearly defined public interest, we need to have local markers of delivery, and I think these can't purely be environmental. They must also be social and economic. And at the same time, we have to see how the, the public estate fits in with and supports that. Mm. Now, you said that you, um, you run a, a wildlife um, business as well, protect people around looking at the... What sort of reaction do you get to people who observe the reds? It could be within the rut, but then they obviously probably realise what your involvement is with managing the, the deer population here too. How does that go as far as uh, chit-chat? It's interesting. I mean, again, I could be shot at here for oversimplifying it, but the standard reaction you get to begin with, because you can see a number of red deer on Ardenmark and because we maintain the population at a level that allows us to have a, a, a reasonable, high-quality sporting cull, that uh, their instant reaction is there must be a problem. And uh, the peninsula's probably... Is that ingrained? Yes. I mean, the, the, the peninsula's got a population of around a thousand red deer. And this could be... But this is people purely from Scotland or is this people internationally? I would say l European, yes. Uh, once you go Asian uh, and towards the, the Americas, I think they're fascinated to actually see anything. I mean... Uh, <laughs> that, that, uh, but it is. I mean, even, you know, I live in the southeast and... It's weird. I, I see lots of deer because I go out with a lot of hunters. But if you're just, you know, I think my children, for example, if they're just, you know, in the day to day, it's quite a thing to see a deer. So I suppose when people are, you know, coming from an area where they're just not out observing deer, they're not out at dusk, they're not out at dawn. So coming here and actually seeing deer just wandering the hillside in daylight mm -hmm. freaks, freaks them out a bit. Well, I, I think being close to deer is a spiritual thing. I've felt, felt that all my life. If you actually are in their company, if you stand next to a cow, you don't feel half as privileged. <laughs> you don't feel half as privileged as you do standing next to a stag. No, God, no. Uh, it's and, a wild animal. And, and I think it's the whole <coughs> idea. It's like, I mean, and, and deer alone don't have that. I mean, if you have a golden eagle swoop past you or, or a sea eagle or a peregrine or any of these things, if you have these encounters, I mean, when we take people out to hunt deer, the point I make to anybody that does a wildlife tour or a hunting tour they're pretty much getting the same guys with the same knowledge imparting the same views. And, and I don't dress it up any differently. I said, you know, we get to 100 metres of a stag or 50 metres of a stag with a telephoto camera, then we take pictures of him and we retreat and leave him to get on about his business. When he's at the end of his working life here, when we cull him, we take him home with us. Fundamentally, those are the only two differences. The, the full experience that the, that the individual gets is the same thing. Mm. And, uh, I mean, you and I went deer stalking last night and ended up looking for otters. Mm. Because you challenged me and said you hadn't seen one. <laughs> you keep telling me the hair. Yeah. Well, you have, to, you have to take your hat off now. I mean, uh, 20 minutes after your threat, there was an otter. <laughs> Good timing as well, because I was getting quite tired. But no, it's true, there is an abundance of wildlife here. And, um, you know, as much as we, we've been talking about the, the fish eagle and, you know, uh, portraying it as being this... Um, 
you know, this uh, destructive animal. It's in, it is incredible. It is I, I mean, beautiful. I, I wouldn't. I mean, when I when I look at it, I, I don't feel any malice or dislike or anything towards the animal. I, I think at the end of the day, the sea eagle is doing what the sea eagle has evolved to do, and survival is at the yeah, top yeah. of his agenda. Yeah, yeah. And after survival comes reproduction, mm. and after reproduction becomes the. The, the widening of the species. He defends his, his area, he, he hunts efficiently, is an awesome bird to see. Mm. The reason when you've seen them up close and they're not that bothered is you're absolutely right. He's the, he's the biggest raptor on the block. Why, well, even when your drone flies past him, you see him looking at it with disgust, going, well, what is that? Uh, and I think to people, yeah, the, but the, the only challenge to make there is that we have to balance our resources to be able to deliver on the environmental stuff, but also to keep people in jobs, to keep visitors coming to the area, to keep an income secure. Uh, and I don't think the impact of modern society can be uh, annulled by turning vast chunks of our country into wilderness. It will not reduce the way that you and I as a species impact on this planet. Only fundamental change in who we are will do that. And I think people that are at the coal face hunting and stalking uh, actually realise this. I'm not aware of any hunting community on Earth that has threatened the success of the planet. I think on that note, we shall leave it. Excellent. Mr. Antry. Thank you. Thank you very much. So there you have it, folks. I hope that you enjoyed that episode of the Field Sports Channel podcast, and uh, I hope that it was helpful and very informative and interesting to you guys. I thought it was absolutely fab. David did a wonderful job. If you would like to become a part of the Field Sports Nation, we are doing a share offer at the moment, so please pop over to fieldsportschannel.tv forward slash shares, and you can become a part of what we do. Uh, also, if you are listening to this on the podcast, then please go to wherever you get your podcasts from and give us a rating. A sneaky five star rating would be really cool and help us a long way to get in front of more and more people like yourself. If you're listening to on iTunes, did you know that you can also rate every single episode, not just the, the podcast channel itself so please don't forget to do that because it's really really important um if you're watching this on youtube then hit the like button give us a big thumbs up smash the subscribe button if you're not already and don't forget to ding the bell because that makes you a part of the bell squad i guess and you will be notified every time we upload either a podcast or any of our fabulous films that we put on fieldsportschannel.tv you can also pop to our website fieldsportschannel.tv where you'll find all of the information that you will need for this particular show. Uh, all the links will be in the show notes, uh, either below on, on YouTube or in the show notes on the uh, podcast as well. So don't forget to do that. But anyway, that's enough waffling from me. It just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening and for watching. And I'll see you guys next time on the Field Sports Channel podcast. Bye bye for now.